It has been my great blessing to have spent most of my life in the company of heroes. Those of you who have read my books or seen my reports from the battlefields around the world for Fox News know that the classical definition of a hero is a person who puts him or herself at risk for the benefit of others. They are the kind of people who stand in harm's way and do not wither in the heat of battle. Such is the character of the person I was asked to introduce to you today. Years from now, when the honest history of the National Rifle Association is written, the Chronicle will have to describe this as a time of extraordinary duress for this great civil liberties organization and our nation. The historians will have to record how a vicious assault was waged by politicians, by the media, by the entertainment industry, and well-financed so-called progressives with one purpose, to destroy the NRA. That record will also have to reflect how the leaders of the NRA responded to protect not just the membership of our organization, but the precious liberties of all Americans. Over the past quarter year, the primary target of this venomous attack has borne the slings and arrows of the left, yet never once flinched. He didn't cut and run. He didn't complain. He didn't bemoan the malicious lies being spread about his character, the threats to his family, or the spiteful intrusions into his privacy. Instead, he decided to stand and fight. He led the way. He led the way all great leaders lead by example, with integrity and courage and tireless energy that are the virtues of real leaders. He, more than anyone else, has led our great organization through a firestorm of conflict. He's endured the assaults as personal and as cruel as cold-hearted as anything I've ever seen. And I do know a little bit about that kind of treatment and the toll it takes on our families. Yet, neither he nor his wife ever lost their goodwill, their charity, their desire to do the right thing for our nation. Imagine four months of waking up to a new attack on the front page of your morning paper. Consider what it's like to see yourself demonized every time you turn on the television, or your every word twisted, every sentence stripped of its context. They thought they could force him off the stage like they've done to so many others before him. Instead, he punched back harder than they ever imagined. He's rallied Second Amendment supporters in speeches all across our country, fighting through countless pressure-packed media appearances and testifying before the United States Senate, something else I know a little something about. <laughs> Through it all, he's remained true to the principles that have always guided him. He stood up to the well-financed Obama, Bloomberg, Biden media attack machine. And everyone in this room, every member of our organization, every American who believes in the principles of freedom ought to be proud and thankful for his leadership, tenacity, and courage. I didn't come here to be popular. I came here to stand for what I believe is true. How have our nation's priorities gotten so far out of order? We care about our money, so we protect our banks with armed guards. We care about our president, so we protect him with armed secret service agents. Yet when it comes to our most beloved, innocent, and vulnerable members of the American family, our children, we as a society leave them utterly defenseless. That must change now. When it comes to keeping our kids in this country safe, nothing else matters. I have people all over the country calling me saying, Wayne, 
I went to bed safe for last night because I have a firearm. Don't let the media try to make this a gun That's issue. Right, but the president's kids are safe, and we're all thankful for it. They also ass. face a threat that most children do not face. You tell that to the people in Newtown. We will not be duped. We will not be demonized. And we will not be divided. Words do have meaning, Mr. President, and those meanings are absolute, especially when it comes to our Bill of Rights in this country. Let me hold up a mirror right now to the whole national news media and the White House. Why doesn't NBC News start with shocking news on Chicago? Why doesn't the National Press Corps, when they're sitting down there with Jay Carney and the President the Vice President, why don't they say, why is Chicago dead last in enforcement of the gun laws against gang Gangs with guns, felons with guns, drug dealers with guns. In the shadow of this Capitol, right under everyone's noses in this building, there's all kinds of drugs and cocaine being sold. By God, gangs are trafficking 13-year-old girls. And gun owners know the truth. Honestly, have they lost their minds over at the White House? Mr. President, we will stand and fight throughout this country as Americans for our freedom. We promise you that. So when it comes to that right, sir, you keep your advice. We'll keep our guns. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the National Rifle Association, please welcome my friend, my fellow Virginian, our Executive Vice President, Wayne LaPierre. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you're kind. We do it all together, one by one, and people just like you all over this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Houston, and good morning. Colonel North, I really appreciate your kind words. You are a, a genuine American hero, and for your service, to God, to our country, and to your NRA. We all salute you, Colonel, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. At this gathering one year ago, I predicted that our freedom might soon face its greatest threat ever. I spent the past year warning gun owners all over this country that if reelected, President Obama would launch an all-out historic attack against our Second Amendment and the personal freedom of hundreds of millions of law-abiding Americans. When I said that, the news media called me paranoid. Obama vehemently denied his anti-gun agenda, mocked us. They even went to the extent of passing out flyers saying that he would protect our rights. And a lot of Americans were deceived into believing him. Deceived. It sure didn't take long for Barack Obama to show himself the real Barack Obama even before he was sworn into office. Before his inauguration, the President launched an all-out historic attack, a siege against our rights, from gun bans to magazine bans to convoluted schemes tantamount to national registration of every gun owner in America, from executive orders voted on by no one to vice presidential commissions and a flurry of legislative attacks, to UN treaties to gut our Second Amendment. Speeches and anti-gun rallies, media appearances, and the heavy-handed weight of the presidential bully pulpit. Apparently, there is nothing the President will not do to get something, anything, through Congress 
to advance his agenda to destroy our Second Amendment. Nothing. So far, thanks to you and millions of Americans all over this country just like you, that's exactly what President Obama has gotten. Absolutely nothing. A lot of courageous men and women in the U.S. House and Senate have stood up to the President, and they have defended our freedom. They've taken a lot of heat from the President, Michael Bloomberg, and the media. So it's really important that they hear from every NRA member, every gun owner, every American who values our freedom and our great country. To those senators and congressmen who have stood with the Second Amendment, we say thank you and ask you to keep defending our rights. You have stood with us, and you have also represented the people in your home states. Let there be no doubt we stand firmly with you. That's important because while the Senate vote less than two weeks ago is significant, it's but one skirmish in what can only be defined as a long war against our constitutional rights. As we sit here this morning, we are in the midst of a once-in-a-generation fight for everything that we care about. We have a chance to secure our freedom for a generation or lose it forever. We must remain vigilant. We must remain ever resolute and steadfastly growing and preparing for even the more critical battles that loom before us. I am proud to report, as I stand in front of you this morning, that the state of our NRA is stronger and larger than it has ever been. You and Americans like you made that happen all over the country. And our commitment to freedom is unwavering, and our growth is unprecedented. Today, the NRA is a record five million strong. even as thousands of Americans join our cause every day and are still signing up. The media and the political elites, they denigrate us, and they cringe at the sight of long lines at gun shows all over this country. They mock Americans who are buying firearms and ammunition at a record pace, and they scold and they scorn the NRA. They don't get it because they don't get America. President Obama, the President of the United States of America, held a press conference 17 days ago and angrily called the NRA liars. Liars? Really? This from a man who spent his entire re-election campaign saying he supported our Second Amendment rights and would never try to take anyone's gun away. And he calls us liars? This from the President, who repeatedly claimed that 40 percent of firearm sales don't involve a black background check. That was never true. And the Washington Post gave the President three Pinocchios for that one. And he calls us liars. The biggest whopper of all, one of the President's favorite lines, is that 90 percent of Americans support his background check, Bill. Yeah, yeah, the media can't rant and rave about anything else. 90 percent of Americans want don't want criminals or the mentally ill to get their hands on guns. Well, I don't know what kind of polling they do down at the White House, but I do know this. 
when it comes to keeping guns out of the hands of violent criminals or the mentally deranged, NRA members agree 100 percent. But, Mr. President, the bill you backed wouldn't accomplish that goal. Your bill was a check that criminals avoid. The bill you ordered the law-abiding to participate in was simply a maze of regulation that could criminalize lawful firearms transactions and create, potentially create, a massive government list of every law-abiding gun owner in the United States of America. The Schumer bill you first supported and you still support would create a database of every gun owner in America. The Manchin-Toomey bill you later backed wouldn't have prevented Newtown, wouldn't have prevented Tucson or Aurora, and won't prevent the next tragedy. None of it, any of it, has anything to do with keeping our children safer at any school anywhere. That's why the President couldn't get the 90 percent of the Senate to go along with him, because Americans saw through the political posturing all over this country. They treasure their freedom. They don't want government to take that freedom away. As they say in Texas, the President's 90 percent is all hat and no cattle. I ran into a member of Congress just a couple weeks ago. We spoke for a moment. And then he said, Wayne, I guess I have to go back and listen to the 90 percent of the phone calls that are not coming in. That's a true story. And it tells you everything you need to know about President Obama's empty 90 percent. So, Mr. President, you can give all the speeches you want. You can conjure up all the polls you can and call NRA members all the nasty names that you can think of. But your gun control legislation won't stop one criminal, wouldn't make anyone safer anywhere, and that flawed failure lost on its merits and got the defeat it deserved. You know, the only 90 the President won't talk about is Chicago, his own hometown, now run by his former chief of staff. The President won't talk about Chicago, but he should, because in the entire United States, Chicago ranks 90th out of 90 jurisdictions in federal firearms prosecutions. Dead last. But when I brought that up on Meet the Press, the media ignored it. The President doesn't talk about that 90. And the national news media, their cameras perched like vultures right now in the back of this hall, they haven't mustered the courage to walk into the White House briefing room and ask about Chicago's 90th ranking that is getting people killed every day and every night, a shooting every 6.3 hours. The deadliest city in America, the President's own hometown, ranks dead last in federal firearms prosecutions, and the media doesn't have the guts to ask him about it. If the President had one clue about how to clean up violent crime, don't you think he'd do it in his own hometown? If his policies brought us Chicago, why do we want to listen to him on anything else?
No, you'll never hear the media ask him that. Maybe it's because all those reporters still have Obama bumper stickers on their cars. Yeah. The national media and the political elites, they're all part of the same class that thinks they're smarter than we are. They know better than we do. They can tell us what to do or not, what to own or not, what to eat or drink or not, and how to live or not. Take Michael Bloomberg. He's, he's gone from mayor of New York to the title of national nanny. From sugar to salt to trans fats to fruit drink to sodas to tell you what you can and can't do or order when you go into a restaurant, this guy just can't seem to find enough ways to boss people around. And now he wants to tell us who to elect or not? Come on, folks. I mean, seriously, I ask you this. If Michael Bloomberg weren't a billionaire, would anybody ever even bother to listen to him? Now he's joined the president created his own billionaire super PAC, ready to spend hundreds of millions to attack the NRA, demonize gun owners, destroy elected officials who won't bow down to his will, and obliterate the Second Amendment, all while the anti-gun media, which supposedly hates money and politics, is all too happy to take and all too breathless to brag about Bloomberg's money and politics. Already they're conspiring right now, regrouping, planning, preparing, organizing, even waiting for, quote, the next Newtown, the next horrific crime, the next senseless, horrific crime to exploit. Just the other day, an anti-gun spokesman told the National Journal, quote, the next new town is inevitable. Those things can help form debate, galvanize people to act. Folks, politics doesn't get any more disgusting than that. They wait to use the opportunity of violent tragedy rather than prevent tragedy itself. Let me say that again. Rather than implement solutions that could prevent senseless violence, they choose broken policies that enable tragedy, tragedy they wait to exploit by choice for political gain. We know that even now there are dangerous, deranged, evil people throughout society prepared to unleash unspeakable violence in our neighborhoods, our schools, and our churches. They use tragedy to try to blame us, to shame us, into compromising our freedom for their political agenda. They want to change America, change our culture. They want to change our values. But you know what? This is America, the first country in the world founded not on a race, not on a religion, not on a royalty, but on a set of God-given principles that we call inalienable rights. We as Americans, come from that long line of patriots who broke from King George to live their own lives as free people. And nowhere does freedom live any more than our Second Amendment right to own a firearm to defend ourselves, our families, and our nation. Without that freedom, we really aren't free at all. There is nothing more good and right than, and normal in America 
than an honest American citizen owning a firearm to defend himself or to protect her family. They can try to blame us and shame us with all their might. But when it comes to defending the Second Amendment, we will never sacrifice our freedom upon the altar of elitist acceptance. We will never surrender our guns. Never. You represent the boys of America. They're hearing from you right now. More Americans today than ever before understand the principle of the Second Amendment, the freedom it gives us as individuals to be responsible for our own safety, protection, and survival. Imagine with me just a minute right now, living in a large metropolitan area where lawful firearms ownership is heavily regulated and discouraged. Imagine waking up to a phone call from the police at 3 a.m. in the morning, warning that a terrorist event is occurring outside and ordering you to stay inside your home. I'm talking, of course, about Boston where residents were imprisoned behind the locked doors of their own homes, a terrorist with bombs and guns just outside. Frightened citizens sheltered in place with no means to defend themselves or their families from whatever might come crashing through their door. How many Bostonians wish they had a gun two weeks ago? How How many other Americans now ponder that life or death question? A recent national poll answered that question decidedly. With danger lurking outside their doors, 69% of Americans said, yes, I want my freedom, I want my Second Amendment, I want my gun. Lying in wait right now is a terrorist, a deranged school shooter, a kidnapper, a rapist, a murderer, waiting and planning and plotting in every community across our country, lying in wait right now. No amount of political schemes, congressional legislation, presidential commissions, or media roundtables will ever change that inevitable reality. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. No bill in Congress, no Rose Garden speech, will ever change that inescapable fact that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Boston proves it. When brave law enforcement officers did their jobs in that city so courageously, good guys with guns stopped terrorists with guns. Uh, all over our country, 
people are more and more frustrated with Washington, D.C. and the political and the media elites. They are dismayed over a political debate that has nothing to do with addressing our problems and everything to do with advancing an old, tired, failed political agenda. Everywhere I go, I've learned that the NRA is truly at the heart of America's heartland, that we are the middle of the river of America's mainstream, and that what we want is exactly what most Americans want. We know our mental health system is in shambles, and we all want it fixed. We want criminals with guns prosecuted and incarcerated. We want the federal gun laws on the books right now enforced against drug dealers with guns, gangs with guns, and violent felons with guns. If they would, every one of you feels that way, I know it. If they would just do that, those violent criminals wouldn't be on their way to the next crime scene. They'd be sitting in prison. We all want our children to be safe. We want them to be protected. That's why we propose trained police and security officers in every single school in our country. And There's not a mom or dad in America that wants to leave their children unprotected. If the Washington elites, if they really wanted the same thing, they would stop demonizing law-abiding American gun owners. They would stop trying to convince the American people that all gun owners are potential criminals in waiting. And they would actually implement programs that addressed our problems in a real and meaningful way put police and trained armed security in every school, enforce the federal gun laws on the books right now, interdict and incarcerate violent criminals before they get to the next crime scene, rebuild our broken mental health system, help the mentally ill by getting them off of our streets and get them into treatment, and for God's sakes, leave the rest of us alone in this country. I hope Washington hears that message you're sending them right now, because the political and the media class, they just don't get it. In a lot of ways, they've lost track of what this great nation is really all about. It's about us and people like us all over our great country. It's always been we the people, not the political class, all the way back to the founding of this country. Here's what I'm talking about. In a recent closed-door speech to donors, politicians, and media, Bill Clinton spoke about American gun owners. Quote, a lot of these people, all they've got is their hunting and their fishing, or they've been listening to this stuff for so long that they believe it all, unquote. And we all remember Barack Obama's 2008 comments to a room of San Francisco elites. Quote, it's not surprising then they get bitter. They cling to guns or religion, unquote. The arrogance of their superiority requires this reminder. They don't rule us. They don't give us rights. We grant them power. They don't make us safe. We pay to protect them. They don't make us free. We're free already. And as long as we have the Second Amendment, we always will be. We are America. And our politicians are only as powerful as we, the people, allow them to be. We are the people. This is our country. This is a fight for our freedom 
and the freedom that separates us from every other nation on Earth. That freedom makes us stronger than other countries, and that freedom makes us better than other countries. That freedom is on the line, and never more on the line than right now and through the 2014 congressional elections. 17 days ago, President Obama said this was only round one. Round two is on the way. They're coming after us with a vengeance to destroy us, to destroy us and every ounce of our freedom. It's up to us, every single NRA member, every single gun owner, all Americans all over this country to get to work right now and to meet them head on with an NRA that's strong enough and large enough to defeat any and all threats to our freedom. Today, today we are a record five million strong. We must not and we will not slow down, not one single bit. By the time we're finished, the NRA must and will be 10 million strong. 10 million, dedicated, patriotic Americans who cherish freedom and all that is good and right about America. So we don't care if it's round one, round two, or round 15. The NRA will go the distance. No matter what it takes, we will never give up or compromise our constitutional freedom, not one single inch. Our feet are planted firmly in the foundation of freedom, unswayed by the winds of political and media insanity, and to the political and media elites who scorn us, we say, let them be damned. So fill your heart with pride. Clear your eyes with conviction. This is our time to stand and fight, now and in the next election and the one after that, now and for the rest of our lives to save our Second Amendment for future generations. We will never back down. We will never surrender. We will always stand. We will always fight. We will always stand and fight for our American freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you.